The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Dominic Frisby, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Podcast, hosted in association with Frisbee's Bulls and Bears with me, Dominic Frisby. It is March the 14th, 2013, and I'm sitting in the offices of John Kay. John Kay is one of Britain's leading economists. His interests focus on the relationships between economics and business. His career has spanned academic work and think tanks, business schools, company directorships, consultancies and investment companies. He's a visiting professor of economics at the London School of Economics, a fellow of St John's College, Oxford, the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's a director of several public companies and contributes a weekly column to the Financial Times. He's also the author of many books and we're here to talk about his most recent. It's called Obliquity and it has the subtitle Why Our Goals Are Best Achieved Indirectly. Now John, um, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show. I I absolutely love the book. Why don't why don't we start by, by giving us a quick overview of, of what it's about and, and how you came to write it? Well, I suppose I came to write it when I realised uh, that the, the most profitable businesses were not characteristically the most profit-oriented businesses. Um, Bear Stearns famously said, we make nothing but money, and the outcome was that in the end they didn't make very much of that. Mm-hmm. And for reasons that were quite explicable, actually, that if you put greed as the centre of your corporate ethos, then the business itself is destroyed by the the greed of the people who work there. Successful businesses are, in fact, created, and profitable businesses are created by people who love business rather than by people who love money. And I came to see, as I thought about that, that, this was a rather general phenomenon, actually, that uh, the happiest people are not those who are most aggressive in the pursuit of happiness, partly because happiness depends on the relationships you have with people around you, and partly because you don't become happy by repeating pleasurable actions. Happiness is, as it were, a state that you create as a result of a wide range of things you do. So what I came to realise, actually, is that complex goals and uncertain environments are typically best pursued indirectly. Very good. And um, one of the wonderful um, examples you use in the book is the, uh, the, the accidental discovery, if you like, of, of the quickest route uh, between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, yes, the, right. it's a strange instance with which I began, which is that actually, although everyone knows the Atlantic Ocean is to the east of the Pacific, actually, to to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, you go east, not west. Uh, that's the route of the Panama Canal. The shortest direct route is actually something like five times longer through Nicaragua. Yeah, so the, the Panama Canal, it, it, it does, it goes from northeast to southwest. Yes, it, it's that's totally right. counterintuitive. And, uh, and, and, you en- and you end up in the Pacific Ocean, well to the east of where you started in the Atlantic. And, and it, 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 that, that quick route wasn't discovered by people looking for the quickest route. No, well, they, the people who discovered it actually didn't know what they were looking for. Keats wrote about it uh, as uh, uh, quarters on a peak in Darien. He wasn't looking for the Pacific Ocean. He'd never heard of the Pacific Ocean. He was looking for gold. He didn't find that, or not at that time, but he did find the world's largest ocean. Very good. Now, um, so, I mean, if I, I, I'm going to quote a little bit of the book, if I may, and um, this is a quote that I actually will be using my book, later, which is coming out later in the year, and, and the quote runs, if you want to go in one direction, the best route may involve going in another. This is the concept of obliquity. Paradoxical as it sounds, many goals are more likely to be achieved when pursued indirectly, whether overcoming geographical obstacles, winning decisive battles, or meeting sales targets. History shows that oblique approaches are the most successful, especially in difficult terrain. Um, 
that, I suppose, is, it kind of sums up the whole ethos of the book in many ways. You know, after I finished the book, I came across a particularly striking example, which is when NASA finally managed to put a spaceship in, order, in orbit around Mercury. Now, actually, Mercury isn't that far away from the Earth, but the route they took to get it there was a hundred times as long as the direct route from uh, Wonderful. Earth to Mercury. And, and when they tried to get like to Mercury? That. They were trying, you bet they were trying to get yeah. to Mercury. Uh, but uh, the direct route, actually, when you th- it doesn't work, and the direct route doesn't work because you either hit Mercury or you pass by the side of Mercury and disappear yeah. into space. And either way, that's not a useful way of taking photographs of Mercury. What they had to do was actually to nudge the spacecraft into orbit round Mercury. And that was an unbelievably oblique process. It, uh, the, the, space shuttle, the spacecraft circled the Earth once, Venus twice, Mercury three times, each time using uh, the, the mass of the planets to make it break and, and manoeuvre, so that finally they actually got a spacecraft in a position where they could take photographs of the planet, which is what they're now doing. Very good. So as, as, a, as a company director, if you're looking at maybe working with a new company and uh, some very kind of go-get young man of you know 35 wearing a very nice suit sits in the office and says, I want to be dominating this sector. We're going to be the, the biggest player in this sector in, in seven years. Do do alarm bells then start going off? Yes, they you? do. I, I write. I, I write. I, I, I've sat through these uh, presentations, in which people confuse the statements of aspiration with strategies for actually getting there. I always thought it's like saying, you know, Saddam had a great stra- Saddam Hussein had a great strategy, which was to defeat the. Americans and uh, take over the oil reserves of the Middle East and the problems were problems of implementation. And that's indeed the kind of thing he did say when he murdered his generals who failed to deliver his objectives for, for him. But actually, strategy and implementation are not in this sense, sense separable. And the pursuit of our goals is actually in, inextricable from the mechanisms by which we achieve them. When you're running a company... What kind of planning do you do? Well, I think you have to have senses of of what I think of are the competitive advantages of the company. You have to understand what it is makes this company different. Why? What can we do that other companies can't do or, right, or we can't do or can't do as well? But then planning for the company isn't about filling books with numbers of where you're going to be in five years' time. Uh, used to be the case that it was almost de rigueur for a company to have these. Quite a lot still do, uh, but they never bear very much relationship to, to what actually happens. You do have to have an idea of what you're doing in broad terms. But for me, running a company is actually like you know, steering a boat. Sometimes you go too close to one bank and you have to steer it back. Sometimes to the other, you steer it back into the middle. You don't quite know what the next bends in the river are going to be. You have to be constantly adjusting, partly because of the changing environment, partly because of your your past mysteering. Now, but one of the problems is, is if you're the CEO of a company and your shareholders want to know what your goals are and you say, you know, we want earnings of such and such and sales of so and so in three years' time and and then the CEO is then judged on whether those targets are reached or not. Should should we not be thinking in those terms? Uh, no, I don't think we should. Uh, do you run your life that way? Of course you don't. Do you know anyone who does? Uh, and if you did know someone who did, you'd think they were a rather sad person who didn't understand how life really worked, or indeed what created the joy and the interest in in the job. And actually in the business context, there's a very fundamental reason why that kind of planning won't work, which is if you could do it, then everyone could do it. And of course the whole origins of success in business are being able to do things that other people can't do. 
I've often thought that when I've heard people in business debating these kind of market share targets and uh, strategic goals, what is it stops their competitors having exactly the same discussion and coming to the same conclusion? Now let's uh, let's turn the attention. One of one of your some of your most influential recent work has been on on banking regulation. Are you happy? with the system of banking as it is now, and if not, what changes would you make? No, I think what we have there is a a, a kind of ongoing disaster. Uh, And it goes, it actually relates to some of the themes we've just been describing. We have the idea that even if the system creates loads of perverse incentives, you know, what we can do is we can impose detailed regulation of behaviour that will stop people behaving in the ways... uh, we don't want them to behave. And that presupposes a, a knowledge and control of the, of the system that we can't actually have. You know, this is a, a complex interdependent, the financial system is a complex interdependent, somewhat chaotic system that is going to evolve and is going to create crises. And what we should be doing is not prescribing detailed rules for how people should behave, but creating structures that are much more robust to the things that will inevitably go wrong and the things we don't know about. And how do we do that? And, well, we've adopted... We're starting to adopt one set of measures which will do that, which will be to create a ring fence between the retail banking side of uh, financial services and the investment banking side, so that it's much harder for failures in the risky part of the business, which are going to happen, so that's, to contaminate those, the day-to-day. That separation is going to be implemented, is it? That's separate, yeah. I think the, the exact detail of what will happen is still up for grabs, but the principle that we're trying to get these things apart is, is now accepted. Are you in favour of a central bank setting interest rates? Well, you know... The funny thing is they don't set interest rates very much anymore. Interest rates are negotiated between banks and borrowers and lenders and the like. The central bank sets the rates the government lends at. Of course, the government, for the moment, is lending a great deal because it's keeping the financial system going. But uh, that's how the world works. Do you think we should be bailing out the financial system or do you think we should let it, let it die and something better replace it? Basically, is let it die and something better replace it. Now, now that isn't quite a realistic proposition put like that. But in 2008, we did the right thing, which was to say we have to prevent, intervene to prevent the system collapsing round our ears. But keeping the existing institutions going for the time being, because their immediate collapse would have been too chaotic, is very different or ought to be very different from saying we're going to underwrite them and keep them in business forever, which is a recipe for both excessive risk-taking on their part and for ossifying the structure of the industry. When should they stop quantitative easing? I'm not very interested in quantitative easing, to be quite honest. Uh, I mean, it's a policy that has not worked very well, mainly because the channels of intermediation have been gummed up by the kind of things we were talking about. And unless we we tackle these issues, uh, we're, we're not going to succeed in making the monetary system uh, useful enough for the real economy. We kind of have a system of government currency now, fiat currency, if you like. Do you think... Are you in favour of competing currencies? You know, Hayek's idea of, of competing currencies? Is that something? No, they're, 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 these are the kind of cranks, monetary recipe. I'm afraid currency is one thing in which a government monopoly really is quite a good idea. Re- well, tell me why? I don't, I, I, I don't, you don't find want to. stories of alternative systems that, that actually hold out any real prospect of working. Do you think there's ever a chance of going back to some kind of, you know, gold-backed currency or anything like that? Why would you want to? Because governments can't print it in the way that uh, they can now. And is governments printing it a problem? 
Well, it creates distortions in the market. It benefits certain people at the expense of others. It, you have the inflation tax, which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, you can have inflation taxes without it. I'd wrote, I don't think the world's currency should be determined by the amount people find in holes in the ground in South Africa. Interesting to hear your hear your views on money. Are you familiar with Bitcoin? Yes, I've come across that. And what, what, would you, what do you think of that? Fad? Yeah. Uh, there's so much now in the financial system that is, as it were, faddish of this kind. You know, the central part of the system is not working. And that's... The, that, that's a real problem that everyone recognises. But actually what we need to do is to reform it so that it does work, not invent some faddish means of dealing with it instead. So, for example, the idea... Crowdfunding on a yeah. small scale is quite a fun and interesting idea. The idea that crowdfunding is going to replace the whole financial intermediation system we have is, is an illusion. What we need to do is make the existing systems and structures work better. It's not that we there is some completely different way of doing all these things that we've been too stupid to implement up to now. What we've done is allow a lot of greedy and incompetent people to get themselves well-paid positions at the centre of the existing system and what we really need to do is to reform it to get them out of it. But these, this kind of talk of reforming and this and that, it's totally contrary to your, to your theory of, to, to, to the, the oblique way that the world works. No, I don't think so. I mean, the, surely the, the financial, we had competing no, currencies, the, the, for the, example. The financial system we've had uh, is something that has developed over a, several hundred years. Uh, mostly because it works in ways we don't fully understand. Now, that means, on the one hand, people who think they understand enough about how it works to come and control it are crazy guys. But it also means people who think we should be replace it by some completely different system that they've worked out in a bar on the back of an envelope are crazy guys no, 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 as no. I well. Think, I think the, the idea is, is that we don't have a system. If with competing currencies, you know, we you leave it to the market to choose what it wants to use as money. You you seem to have an idea of the wisdom of the market that I don't. I I don't believe the market is wise. I do believe that a world in which people are allowed to experiment has a lot to be said for it. Now, the truth is, in terms of what people use as currencies, that, yeah. there's been experiment for hundreds, thousands of years. Yeah, and the system we have is actually the product of that. I mean, it doesn't work badly. What, what does work badly at the moment is some large, non-manageable financial institutions. The system of money doesn't favour savers. It favours debtors. Well, the way we're operating it at the moment favours debtors, and that beca that's because the debtors have a lot more political clout than the savers do. Very true. John, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and getting your thoughts. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, but I know you're very friendly with with uh, Mervyn King. How positive is he feeling about the economy at the moment? What, what about, you know, the financial world in the next three or four years? What, what are his thoughts? I, right. I don't think I can answer your, your question directly. Uh, I'm sure, I can say I'm sure Mervyn will be rather relieved to be retiring from the job he's currently doing in, um, <laughs> in two or three months. There's more trouble ahead, in other words. I, of course there's more trouble ahead. Right. The only question is how much and when. OK. Are you buying stocks at the moment? Not many. <laughs> Um, your, why don't you give out as we close, John? I'm going to say one more time. The book is called Obliquity. It's by John Kay. Um, I'll put a link on the homepage so that you can buy it um, through Amazon or any other means. The, the publisher is Profile Profile Books. in the UK and Penguin in the US. Very good. And the website, your website, uh, where you have a very interesting blog, is johnkay.com. Johnkay.com, yeah. Very good. Well, John. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter 
at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.